Um, I'm going to be talking about from zero to Kubernetes at Condé Nast International. So work at Wildy, redundancy of slides again, which you've already heard. Um, so we are currently working with uh, Condé Nast International. So Condé Nast International um, builds all of these um, beautiful magazines, um, which include kind of disputed magazines um, for GQ, Vogue, Traveller, The New Yorker, Vanity Fair, and a load of others. Now, our main focus with our engagement with Condé Nast was to bring GQ and Vogue um, into kind of the new spotlight, to kind of revitalize their stack, to make everything non-legacy, and to make everything perform a lot faster. So, the plan. We plan to uh, move Vogue and GQ in the following markets, so that's Germany, Spain, uh, France, Italy, Mexico, United Kingdom, India, Taiwan, Russia, China. So a lot of different uh, markets, a lot of different places, interesting problem to tackle. Um, so the, kind of, the plan was to geolocalize um, our clusters to the indiv individual markets, um, which is an interesting balance between how many clusters we have and how far away we should place these um, clusters from our end users. Um, we also want to make sure our engineers um, within the organization have access to the clusters, either via kubectl or by other kind of um, paradigms as well. So we didn't want to kind of abstract all of complexity away. Instead, we just wanted to provide everything there and allow basically tools to be built on top of that. And that's the minimal abstraction we have there. And then finally, um, we were kind of moving to Kubernetes um, and away from ECS in Amazon. So kind of where, where we began, um, we were a small team. We had one production environment in ECS, one staging environment in ECS, which ran production stuff sometimes, which was scary. Um, there was only internal tools running, pretty much. Um, so there wasn't anything customer facing, um, just internal um, customers, pretty much. Um, there was two platform engineers, um, so not many of us. <laughs> Um, and in total, there's three engineering teams. Um, to kind of give a bit of a, I guess, example where we are now, about two years later, there is about 15, 15 engineers in the platform team and uh, a plethora of engineering teams. I think there's about 15 to 20 engineering teams, totaling around five or six engineers each. So it's quite a large scale up. So why? Why are we doing this? Why are we moving to Kubernetes? Why are we scaling like this? So um, kind of legacy-wise, each individual market um, ran their own software and they ran their own infrastructure. So there was Drupal sites, WordPress sites, custom-built sites, sites built in Perl, uh, and then just infrastructure from random machines and data centers to AWS to Google Cloud to I have even no idea where anything else is. Um, the look and feel of each individual um, site differed between markets, so Vogue France looked very different to Vogue Germany, and GQ um, UK looked very different to GQ in Japan. Um, so the consider consideration of these two kind of makes the kind of whole experience for people um, flow through no matter which market they're running in. Um, and this also meant we wanted to kind of modernize and consolidate all of their technology into kind of a centralized place. So instead of having six well, actually, 13 different um, sets of uh, infrastructure. We have just a single uh, unified uh, platform. And we also needed, and this is kind of the big point, we needed a platform that was available in China, Russia, and the rest of the world. So something that would run in all those different areas. Um, I won't too, talk too much about China, but it's difficult based on the Great, Wall of Fire, the Great Firewall of China, as well as the lack of any real Western um, infrastructure services such as AWS or um, Google Cloud, even though they do exist. So um, what does this look like? So yes, yeah, so we have 11 markets in total, 62 websites, 200 million unique users a month, with a digital readership of about 1.1 billion um, people in general, um, which is huge numbers. Um, and this is kind of a global map of where our main user base exists. Um, average DAO, it's not really exactly like this because China and Russia are absolutely huge and all of the users don't actually exist 
evenly spread across the whole place. But in general, we have Europe, we have Mexico, and then we have Asia. It's kind of like how we've hyperlocalized, and we can kind of see this here. We've um, we decided to place our data centers as close as needed to each of the individual markets. So we have one in the US, one which is in Ireland, one which is in Frankfurt, and then one which is in Tokyo. Um, I'll explain why this decision was made in a second. Um, so to give you kind of an idea, this is kind of all of the clusters that we have. So we don't have too many clusters, but um, we have two clusters in the US one, a tools environment. Um, we have one which is a prod environment in the US. Um, in EU Central one, we have our dev, um, which is specifically for the platform team. And then um, engineering teams only have staging and production. And then we have um, Asia Pacific, which has um, a production environment as well. In total, we kind of have 135 nodes um, running Kubernetes and other assorted kind of um, applications that kind of help us run our infrastructure. Um, now, these are actually reducing now. I think we've kind of almost halved the amount of nodes we were running because we've doubled the size of them and we're switching to much bigger instances. But at the time I was writing the slides, it was 135. I think it's down to 75 now as well. So a bit annoying for the presentation, but we'll continue. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, so not all markets are near the associated regions, right? So for example, um, if you're in Mumbai, going to the Asia Pacific Northeast um, data center is 139 milliseconds, which isn't too bad, but if you think about for each request that a browser makes and um, a, there's a lot of assets and a lot of images, that time stacks up and it can make the experience not as nice. So we ended up choosing um, Fastly, um, which meant we put each individual red dot, sorry if you color blind, I really chose terrible color for this, but we, we, we utilized their points of presence to kind of hyper localize as close as we can. Um, with the, if you ignore China and Russia for now. Um, and this allows us to serve the content um, as close to the user as possible. So it's cached at these endpoints. Um, we tried to cache as, diff as much as we can. Um, for China and Russia, I didn't overlay any um, information, but we're going to use um, localized uh, CDN providers in those regions because of, uh, again, the kind of uh, hyper local. Um, I guess, laws around kind of data protection, et cetera. It really is only the providers in those areas that you can actually use. So as you can see, we use a lot of um, imagery and advertisements inside of our pages. Um, most of them are really easily cacheable. Um, so we rely heavily on our cache um, to serve up basically as much content as possible. Um, there isn't much dynamic content yet. Um, so it actually alleviates quite a lot of our problems, but we do still see quite a bit of load, um, but not as much as if it was everything was going to origin, which is quite nice. So how do we get here? The juicy stuff now, right? So we run self-hosted XHD and Kubernetes um, in AWS using Terraform to build it all up. Um, we run container Linux on each of our nodes. Um, now, Container Linux was a CoreOS project. They've been purchased by Red Hat. So we're in kind of the, the point of the project where we're possibly reevaluating whether we continue going down that route or if we um, make some modifications. Um, but that's pretty much how we are at the moment. Um, so the actual stack. Um, so we utilize this project called Tectonic X Installer. Again, this was a CoreOS project. It was an enterprise project, but um, we utilized or leaned heavily on the open source components of it. Sadly, that has now disappeared into the uh, open shift, uh, I guess, black hole of operational work. Um, so we kind of are now in the um, area of maintaining our own fork, and it's not as nice as it could have been. Um, but we also utilize uh, key.io, the um, FK st stack, which is Elasticsearch, Fluent, D, and Kibana uh, for our logging. We lean heavily on Helm for our um, most of our application deployments. Um, we use Datadog instead of Prometheus for our metrics, and we use CircleCI and Concourse for delivering our pipelines. So this is kind of a layout of our clusters per availability zone um, in general. It's not actually 
100% true, because we have a lot more nodes, but we run three masters, and we run three XXD nodes, and that handles basically over 150 nodes easily. And we haven't had any issues since we've started these up. Um, we've seen a couple of latency issues inside of XXD, but it kind of, all that means is the writes are a bit delayed. Um, endpoints take a while to update, so deployments happen to take a bit longer. Um, but nothing kind of out of the ordinary. Um, so we kind of run um, each XHD node and master node in an availability zone. So we can suffer an outage in each availability zone. Um, the same is again for our nodes as well. Um, so we can kind of distribute our workloads into three separate zones. Um, so if we kind of dive down and look into kind of our master nodes, um, we, this is kind of like the core thing that runs on every node um, underneath. And on top is basically the specific pods that run on our master nodes. So we're on the API server, control manager, scheduler, queue proxy, and kubelet, even though kubelet's on every node. Um, we run these as pods, so it's very much self-service. So um, Kubernetes bootstraps itself and then injects the API server to run as a pod, um, which is really nice from a management perspective because you can basically use the kube, um, CTL command line to manage itself, um, which is interesting, but it does have its uh, downfalls as well. Um, we've thought about kind of using kind of systemd units to run these um, ourselves, but um, it's something that's too much of a piece of work to change. So we're kind of a bit careful and tread around um, the specifics of um, modifying any of those pods or deployments. Um, now, run uh, the uh, daemon sets and the um, deployments that run on each node. So we use kube to IAM to um, restrict permissions um, to basically null root um, AWS calls um, from each node because each node has a instance profile which the containers on it can assume straight away. So we basically use that to null root it as a security privilege. We use uh, Flannel and Calico in conjunction together as the networking layer. So we use Flannel as basically the overlay network and then Calico for policy enforcement. It's called Canal. <laughs> um, we use Datadog for our metrics. So a, a Datadog metric uh, pod runs on every individual node. Um, we use FluentD, which kind of mounts all of the containers logs and then pipes it off to Elasticsearch. And we use something called Cluo, which is interesting. It, is a container Linux update operator. Um, what that does is basically pulls um, the container Linux registry, and if there's an update, it <coughs> schedules each node for a reboot. So we basically have nodes updating itself based on when updates come out. So it kind of manages coordinating nodes, bringing them down, and then bringing up new nodes as well, which is really, really nice. So we've never had to manually do a um, OS update or anything along the lines of that. We just let it do its thing and it just continuously goes. So I guess one question is why do we run our own control plane and et cetera D when there's things like um, EKS, um, Google's offering, Azure's offering. Um, the main thing at the time was uh, EKS didn't exist. Um, and the reason we didn't go to Google Cloud is uh, Google Cloud's not available in China. So we kind of had to think of a offering that was portable across all of many different infrastructures. Um, in the end, we decided that actually running our own um, control plane and uh, having the Terraform underneath it kind of build the infrastructure allowed us to port it to any other possible um, cloud platforms in the future. Um, it just so happens that China now does have kind of AWS compatible APIs, even though it's not run by um, AWS itself. It basically has um, companies in China that implement the AWS APIs. Um, so you can pretty much Terraform run against that, which is great. Um, and uh, yeah, in Russia, that's still a problem that we haven't actually fixed. The other reason is it's more fun. Um, well, it's fun, but it's, and honestly, we were learning a lot about it, uh, learning a lot about how Kubernetes works. Um, most of the team didn't really know Kubernetes at all. So we started building to kind of 
understand it. And then as time progressed, we realized that actually it's quite a sane decision from our end based on where we need to go and how we deploy there. So how, how do we get all this stuff into production? So for our cluster changes, we use uh, something called Concourse as our um, pipeline to push things through. Um, this is our Kubernetes pipeline uh, with different hold steps here and there. Um, it's quite nice. It works quite well of us. Um, we basically have different stages for deployment and then acceptance tests that run, um, conformance tests, and then we hold and move into another environment and then into another environment. Um, it works quite f well for us, but um, we also use Circle CI for all of our application teams. So we're look in the midst of kind of porting this over to Circle CI. So we have just a singular, um, I guess, CD pipeline. Um, how applications are deployed, as I was just saying, um, application code runs in Circle CI. Everything is Dockerized. Um, which makes it really easy because we just then get application teams to push it over to Key.io, which is our um, image storage for Docker images. And then um, we have this, um, these uh, base charts that we've defined inside of um, our own Helm registry. So we have a couple of um, base charts. It's, for example, a website that has um, a front end you can use a specific Helm chart, and application teams just basically do Helm, deploy this base chart, and then um, specify the overrides in the YAML configuration to change parameters. Clear one line code, and an application is deployed, which is really, really nice. Um, however, we also have the benefit that teams can utilize and implement their own Helm charts, so they can run whichever Helm chart they want. Um, also, they can run um, pure. Uh, YAML as well, if they wanted to build up their own um, Kubernetes deployments, that kind of flexibility is still there, um, which is quite nice in that space. So kind of where we've got to now, we've um, all of the green lights that are lit are um, basically all the markets for Vogue and GQ that we've switched over to use this new Kubernetes platform. So basically, with the exclusion of Taiwan, Russia, and China, we're pretty much all there. Um, the bottom that's is um, for fashion shows, which is kind of like a, a high throughput um, time in Vogue's kind of yearly calendar, which is about now. Um, and this is kind of um, specific um, fashion photography that gets pushed through. And this is kind of a high volume, um, high image and throughput. So there's lots of images. Um, so there's a lot more data being sent. Um, so it's kind of, I put it on there as a little extra thing to show off. So we've only had a few platform outages um, in the last two years. Um, so yeah, the whole of this kind of migration has happened over the last uh, two years, pretty much. Um, so I, I would say that's kind of a really big success on our part is we haven't kind of crashed too hard. Um, both of them were due to the same component failing, which was uh, DNS. So. DNS in both parts um, ran out of CPU um, because all of our services were basically requesting too many things too quickly and things fell over. So the first one was um, also interesting as we had our pipelines configured uh, incorrectly. So we actually ended up deploying Asia Pacific over the EU cluster, um, which broke all of our self-hosted Kubernetes pods. So that was also a, um, a failure in the, um, on the masters. At that point in time, we didn't actually have any customer facing impact because the masters went down. It just meant scheduling and scaling wasn't broken. That's was quite nice. We were very happy with the resilience there. And then as we were trying to delete pods and kind of get everything fixed and back working again, I decided to delete um, this cube DNS pod. I was like, oh, it's scheduled somewhere else, forgetting that the scheduler is actually not working took down um, all of the DNS pods by mistake, and there was no DNS in the cluster. Uh, total cluster outage, we were down for like two hours or something like that. Um, but we were able to restore it, get it back and working, which is grand. Um, the second one was pretty much just, we've just released a couple of new markets, and we were just saturated with CPU, and were not able to scale quickly, and just ran out and basically had sporadic failures. 
Now, most of these errors were actually caught by a CDN, so we were able to serve stale content, so the user impact was quite low, um, but it wasn't zero, so we definitely still had some user impact. So I guess mitigations from this perspective is we use um, horizontal pod autoscalers to scale out um, kind of our core services. So we scale on clust um, custom metrics from Datadog, which is a really nice thing. Um, so this kind of helps us in the case of um, having high um, intensity, um, I guess, a uh, page with lots of page views coming through, such as a new Paris fashion show coming out. Um, at that point in time, um, the system self uh, well, reacts to those changes and kind of scales proportionally based on the number of requests, um, the amount of CPU that's being used, and if the memory is increasing. Um, another thing is we have cluster autoscaler in place. So at the point where nothing can schedule onto the cluster, um, the cluster autoscaler looks for any pending pods, and if they're there for too long, decides to um, scale out using the um, AWS autoscaler. So that kind of continuously adds nodes to our pool um, and then takes them away when they're not needed from a cost management perspective. Another thing we do is um, monitoring and observability using Datadog and PagerDuty. Now, We've had kind of some successes and some failures with Datadog on this side. Um, it's good because there's a nice UI, all of the engineers get to use it. Um, it's quite easy to experiment and play with. They have some nice features there. But from a kind of a platform um, perspective, I think it's not as featureful as, say, Prometheus. Um, it's something that we're on the midst of uh, evaluating to see if actually for our um, for our teams, is it worthwhile shipping our metrics somewhere else so we have um, better insight? Um, and then the, I guess the last thing for us, um, because we can, um, in the case of failure, cache as much as possible at the CDN, um, serve as much stale content as, pro as possible. Um, it's better for us to show that um, cached or stale content um, because it's much better than showing nothing um, in our case. So that's kind of our key learnings. So I'd say thank you very much for listening. And uh, I would love to hear some questions if there are any.